Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar, which will provide an introduction to the process involved in building a school-wide, multi-tiered system of support. My name is Jenny Smith Brock. I am the director of the Smart Learning Lab on the Gorham campus of the University of Southern Maine. The Smart Lab is part of the Southern Maine Area Resource Team for Schools and is funded by the Reading Matters to Maine Fund of the Maine Community Foundation. The lab provides free and low cost after school tutoring to area elementary students. In addition, SMART offers professional development opportunities for educators. This webinar is the first in a series of four webinars the Learning Lab is hosting this year. I am very pleased to introduce our two presenters this afternoon. Dr. Rachel Brown is Associate Professor at the University of Southern Maine. And Dr. Rebecca Bickford is a psychologist and assistant director at the Margaret Murphy Center for Children. They have co-authored a book due out in December entitled Practical Handbook of Multi-Tiered Systems of Support. I will now hand the microphone over to Dr. Brown. Jenny, thank you so much. We are very delighted to be here this afternoon with you and um, are going to hope that we can convey in the short time we have um, the key features of how you can uh, build the supports necessary for multi-tier systems of support. Um, it's a big undertaking, so we will not be able to cover everything in one hour, but this session will last from 4 to 5 p.m., it is being recorded so that um, if you'd like to go back and see it later or invite colleagues to view it later, it will be available on the website of the Smart Learning Lab when we're all done. <clears throat> I'm going to start with an overview of what is a multi-tier system of support. Um, and then we'll talk about the components of an MTSS, the benefits, how it connects to other supports, in particular supports in relation to special education um, services. And then we have time for questions. Many of you sent in questions in advance and we have those printed out so that we can dive in and answer those questions at the beginning. But you're certainly welcome to ask additional questions. And if we have time, we will get to those as well. So the first piece is just defining what is a multi-tier system of support. And many folks are familiar with this term having emerged over time as a successor to some other approaches to tiered supports. But we define it as a method of supporting all students in public schools. And um, the need for that, obviously, I think is quite clear. Of course, many of us probably just yesterday learned or heard about our state's NAEP scores and how the, the data were not too encouraging, particularly in the area of mathematics. Um, and so it's clear that US public schools can benefit from continuing to work on ways that improve outcomes for all students. In that regard, and this is partially how Becca and I um, came together to write um, our forthcoming book, we see it as integrating the methods that have previously been explained through a response to intervention framework and or positive behavioral interventions and supports framework. Um, these are both very good and strong models of helping all students. However, our experience is in working in schools for over 25 years that sometimes they get siloed and people put huge emphasis on one to the exclusion of the other and vice versa and are not in a position to be able to really work toward um, supporting all the needs of students. And so this model is really focused on offering in increasingly intensive support for students when they need it. And that's a definite key piece to it is that it means that we have a way to truly be responsive to students, whether they need help from an academic or behavioral perspective, and provide those supports as soon as possible in real time. The graphic you see in front of you is one that my colleague Mark Stagy and I have published a couple of times, and we decided that we would use it as a component of our framework as well. And so uh, it will appear <laughs> once again in another Guilford publication um, as a way to articulate that uh, multi-tier system of supports is something that truly encompasses the needs of all students. And a couple key features of this particular triangle are that, of course, it incorporates supports on both academics and behavior, 
But in addition, it has the special education area in the middle. And that's very intentional because it recognizes that students with disabilities who participate in special education do not necessarily always and only need intensive supports that are somehow outside of a support system or only at the most intensive end of the support system. We know the vast majority of students with disabilities and who have IEPs um, spend the majority of their day in a general education environment. And so this triangle is designed to respect and embrace that and recognize that their needs fall along a continuum, just as the needs of students who haven't necessarily um, been identified as a student with a disability. A couple other key features are the representation of the percentages of students who are likely to have their needs met at a particular tier. So many of you may be familiar with the 80%, 15%, 5% numbers. Um, those are a reflection of uh, both an accumulation of data from public health as well as an increasing number of schools and districts who have successfully implemented this model. Um, and then finally, another piece is how the words data cross the tiers. And this is a feature that Dr. Stege and I incorporated in our very first triangle. Um, and we really feel that's important because it reflects the extent to which data are the pathway by which decisions are made. And that we really wanna focus on looking at students' data in real time and have that be the approach we take to all instructional decisions instead of relying upon gut instinct or I think or any of the other ways in which decisions about student supports have been made in the past. <clears throat> so in terms of components, uh, what you see in front of you are the five areas that we're going to touch on in our brief time today, but that we see as essential and necessary. And a, a, an aspect of this that was reflected in some of the questions sent ahead of time and which we'll keep reiterating is that there is no way to do this without uh, going through and embracing all five of these. Trying to implement a, an effective system of supports for all students by just focusing on one of these in isolation will lead to failure. And I say that um, because I've, I've been there. Um, I have tried to do some of these things separately as a lone wolf um, or in a silo and have faced the challenge and the frustration of it not working because it was not connected. So we do put a heavy emphasis on that, uh, both in the book and here, in terms of how to make connections across the various components. So to touch more on the prevention aspect, um, it's important to recognize that we really have to shift our thinking more to a prevention mindset. So that means that both for academics and behavior and also for mental health and other um, social issues, if you're incorporating those things, um, it's important to recognize that we need to be thinking about the needs of all students. So when Rachel showed you the triangle and talked about um, the 80%, 15%, 5% numbers, um, one of the common misunderstandings is that we will provide universal support to 80% of students. And we're urging people to recognize that we will provide universal supports to 100% of our students. So that means making sure that the curriculum that we have in place for reading, for example, um, is available to 100% of our students, and um, it's an evidence-based and effective curriculum for our students. What we know is that even when we have an effective curriculum in place, we won't have 100% success from our students. So we anticipate, and the research has shown, that if what you're doing at Tier 1 is truly effective, 80% of your students will be successful. So if we think about that in terms of behavioral support, um, that means that we need to have systems in place to teach and reinforce appropriate behavior. And that if we're doing that well, our data will, will show that 80% of our students are being successful with what we're offering. Um, then we recognize that about 15% of our students should need additional support. They've been identified as struggling students and they need typically small group support, 
Um, in terms of behavior, it's usually not function based at that point. And in terms of academics, it's often, you know, students have been identified as um, being slightly behind their peers, being behind where they need to be, and needing a, um, additional more intensive support to get caught up. Um, and then we have tier three, where we're offering intensive support, typically on an individual basis, to students who have fallen uh, more seriously behind. Um, and for academics, we're thinking about uh, what, in, what intervention can we put in place to get this student caught back up, um, and that remains our goal to get them on track for where they need to be. And in terms of behavior, at that point, we're thinking in terms of a function-based behavior support plan for that student. So when students reach the point of tier three, they have had access to tier one and typically to tier two and have still not been successful. And so we are moving on to a tier three more intensive support for them. It's difficult to um, underestimate the need for collaboration in this work. Um, and collaboration extends from everything from forming effective teams to do the work, um, developing the systems for teams to use to make decisions and work together and achieve their goals, um, to having buy-in from everyone in the building. And um, we typically don't achieve 100% buy-in, but we uh, fall back on the 80% rule typically. So if we can get 80% of our faculty on board with the changes that we're making, uh, we typically can have a lot of success. So this can be a change. Um, certainly Rachel and I have worked in some buildings where it is more common for teachers to be more alone in their classrooms doing the things that they're doing or maybe to be working in grade level teams. And this work really requires people from across the building to come together and collaborate and um, ha have a shared vision um, develop shared processes and work toward the same goal. I guess I can talk a little bit more about the number of teams piece. Okay. Um, and that is something that we spend a lot of time on in our book, but it varies by school. Um, and I can speak more to the behavior side and then Rachel can chime in on the academic side mm -hmm. if she would like. But um, typically for developing um, a multi-tiered system of support for behavior, we need, uh, the first team that we need is a universal team that is working to develop tier one. So when it comes to behavior, most schools do not have an effective um, curriculum and process for instruction and process for reinforcing appropriate behavior in place. So that is our first order of business. And it takes um, a lot of time and effort to put that together. It is not something that you buy from a publisher. It is something that you de develop um, among colleagues in the setting, um, and it's um, culturally relevant to the setting and is a good fit for the people in, in the community. Um, so that's our first order of business. As we get that established, we move on to developing, we're typically calling it a tier two team, and those folks are looking at the tier one data and other sources of data to determine the students that need additional support at tier two. And then we work toward developing a tier three team that is um, looking at those students who've not been successful with tier one and tier two and figuring out ways to identify those students, get them in contact with an appropriate intervention and then monitor their progress going forward. I'll add to uh, what Becca shared about the absolute importance of teams. And one of the things I can say in regard to academic teams is the school size really does matter. Um, you can only have so many teams when you have only so many teachers or other grown-ups. I have consulted to schools in larger areas, um, in uh, mostly the northern part of the United States, but anywhere from Maine to Alaska. And um, you still have to have teams, even if you are a small village school with 15 students and one or two teachers. Um, that might seem odd, but it's really conceptualization around the process by which you make decisions. 
Um, and sometimes teams might be more blended in regard to other functions that need to occur, particularly in those really, really small rural schools. We see a lot more sharing um, in terms of how decisions are made and resources between general and special education in more rural places um, because it's a reflection of function, whereas in larger places, there's more room for customization. And then I will just add that um, if you are interested in the growing movement toward integrating academics and behavior, it is really important to get the right people on a team to look at, at those um, the different aspects that students bring to the table. One of the things that we know is um, students who are struggling behaviorally are often struggling academically and vice versa. So um, sometimes a student has um, a learning disability and a behavioral disorder or interfering behavior that are unrelated, but oftentimes those things are related to each other and one is contributing to the other. In that case, it's, it's so important to have the right people at the table because we can design academic interventions that take the function of behavior into account. Um, so for example, if a student is a struggling reader who has um, interfering behavior that is typically uh, the result of seeking attention from peers or from adults, we can put interventions in place that allow the student to both um, develop appropriate reading skills and get attention at the same time. So that student we might want to have in a, a small group of students who are uh, learning those reading skills. We are fortunate to live in a time where there is more research than ever about change. And a lot of attention has been, has been paid to and continues to be paid to this, the process of change. Um, I think the conversation started really with how do we change as individuals? What's necessary for us to go through the change process? And there's been some really interesting research on that. Um, and it's, it really parallels the research that's being done in implementation science about what the change process looks like for organizations and systems. Um, one of the things I guess that we wanna emphasize, and it's, this is a really big conversation that we can't really do justice to today, but we want to emphasize that it is so important to pay attention to the change process. So there, there needs to be a process for how we identify um, the changes that we want to make and the options that we consider and how we build buy-in as a community and then how we navigate that process going forward so that we end up with something that people feel like they've had a voice in and they feel ownership of and that they will actually implement. So it is not enough to have an effective intervention that needs to be coupled with an effective implementation. And oftentimes it is the um, effective implementation that is missing. So I've certainly encountered a lot of schools who've attempted to use positive behavior supports on a system-wide level and they've not been successful. And so they say to me, oh, we tried PBIS and it didn't work. And I say, well, tell me about your implementation because if you have not paid a lot of attention to that, um, I would not expect PBIS to work. Oftentimes, um, schools do best when there is someone coming from the outside to facilitate the change process, someone who can take the big picture perspective and who really isn't involved in the, the existing dynamics among people working in the school, but who just can keep the team focused on the, the outcome and the goals the team has set. Um, we've made note here that this process typically takes five years. We I think when we first started doing this work, we were saying three to five years, and then um, we've learned a lot since then, but it is typically a five-year process, at least. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm certainly working with schools who've been in the process for longer than that. If you want to build um, a thorough and effective and sustainable process, um, it, is, it will be the subject of a lot of time and effort over a period of time. When you get to the end of that, um, what you have is a school culture and climate where people say, this is just how we do things here. And people have the sense that that's how we've always done things here. Um, and it becomes robust and sustainable and adaptable over time. Um, but it really is um, the result of, of those years of effort that have been put into the process. 
I know that we have a question from John Keene. Um, John, you're welcome to activate your microphone and ask it, or you can certainly also type it in. We can't hear Okay. John, if we're speaking, I don't think we can hear you. You can type the question in. Okay. We're going to have you go ahead and type the question, and then we'll um, keep an eye on that, and keep, uh, we'll keep going. But we're going to have lots of time for question at the end. We've received some questions in advance that we hope to get to at the end, and if people want to continue to send questions in, we would be happy to... Um, spend as much time as we have at the end answering those questions. So uh, now we're going to talk a bit about effective instruction. And um, I'll lead off in talking about this in regard to academics, and then Becca will join me in terms of behavioral interventions and instruction. Um, there are some key practices that are really, really important to this. And I, um, both of us, have been classroom teachers and um, are sensitive to the fact that you know, there are aspects of implementation that do not always get attended to, and that has a huge impact on whether it actually is really possible. And so many times, like Becca, I've encountered um, schools where they think they've implemented something and done something, but there were critical steps missing at the beginning that really thwarted the potential for true success. So when we talk about effective instruction, we uh, are starting with the premise that whatever is selected as an instructional material and method, and I'm sort of using the umbrella of uh, part of it is going to be what are the materials you select, but part of it's also going to be what are the methods that are used, that these are materials and methods that have been validated in multiple research studies. Um, not just one, not just hearsay, but there's really good evidence that this is something that's going to work. And of course, there is an emerging body of information available to teachers and anybody who wants to go looking for it about what constitute evidence-based practices in education. And that's really, really important for teams and others to be aware of because there are actually some good resources that could guide you in the right direction from the get-go. Um, and in terms of, well, exactly how much evidence is needed, uh, there isn't necessarily a firm rule on that, but uh, something that I always like to point out is the more students who will be affected by a given practice, the more important that you have more research. And so, for example, when it, you are looking to select a core reading, math, writing program, I would like to see multiple research studies that document how it worked in settings that are similar to the needs of your students, whether it be a large metropolitan urban school district or maybe a sm smaller urban, uh, excuse me, suburban or rural school district. But then related to the, you know, knowing that there's actual strong evidence of the materials and methods, an absolute key variable is training. And this is probably the piece that I have seen least implemented throughout my career. Um, there is an increasing body of evidence that districts are looking for the right programs, if you will. Um, they recognize that evidence base is important. But there tends to be not enough time and energy put into the training component. And in absence of the training necessary to do something correctly, we're leaving teachers, I would argue, almost as victims of um, a system that's not there to support them. They deserve that ongoing training. And so money invested in good training and continuous training is going to pay off over and over and over again. And this is definitely one of the features of effective implementation of, of tiered supports. With that, of course, is um, a, some sort of tool to figure out which st students need more help when. And we don't give much time to this in this presentation, but there are many, many resources about um, how to engage in screening and progress monitoring of students. And yes, this can and should be done both in the area of academics and behavior. Um, that is part and parcel of effective instruction. If you're not going to engage in screening and progress monitoring, it probably doesn't matter what you pick for instruction because you're not going to know whether or not it works. 
Um, so those two things really have to be paired. And then the last piece that's probably second on the list of things that don't happen as often as we need them to, so this is right after training, is that there is follow through um, and actual use of procedures to verify the teaching integrity. In other words, are the teachers using the materials and methods as they were intended? Um, and again, that is going to be driven heavily by the training they've received, but we know that all of us are going to improve our performance if we get good feedback. And so embracing um, efforts to support treatment integrity, teaching integrity, um, that are focused on a professional development mindset, not a punitive mindset. Um, it should be the case, I would argue, that when this is operating well, teachers are excited to have folks come into their classrooms and observe them because they know they're going to get feedback right away, no later than the end of the day, about how they're doing. And they know they're going to be able to improve practices on the basis of those observations. And so um, looking at ways to make that a regular practice in every building is essential. I have worked with some great principals who make it their daily practice to walk in and out of every classroom in the building. Sometimes they stay longer in some than others, but it means that there is literally an open door policy and teachers are expecting that and they welcome it because it's gonna help them and their students and it, they don't perceive it as punitive. So getting to the place where we have good, reliable evidence that things are implemented accurately is a super important part of effective instruction. So the way that Rachel described um, how we support teachers and and providing effective instruction and engaging in this work is a very good uh, description of how we support students in terms of developing appropriate behavior in the school setting. Um, it's very similar. We need to provide instruction. We need to provide support. We need to provide ongoing feedback. Our focus, um, whenever possible, needs to be on what's going well, but we need to provide uh, corrective feedback as appropriate. Um, one of the challenges that we have is that we tend to be far more um, attuned to when our students or our teachers are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And we tend to interact with them at those times. Um, in the past, we have thought of behavioral instruction as really when we mess up, when they mess up, we will let them know. Um, and that probably worked for us. It probably will work for some of our students. We are probably those students that when a teacher let us know that what we were doing was not what we were supposed to be doing, um, we figured out what we were supposed to be doing instead and we made that change going forward. The students that we're most concerned about in terms of behavior uh, are typically not the ones who are going to respond to that kind of feedback well. They're typically not behaving the way that they are because they've not received uh, feedback about their inappropriate behavior in the past or their interfering behavior in the past. So what we have to do is really engage in a paradigm shift so that we are taking responsibility for agreeing as a community of educators what we want our students to know about behavior in school. And we're developing ways of actively teaching that to students and we're developing ways of uh, reinforcing that behavior when it occurs and providing feedback to them. Um, and then when we need to provide corrective feedback, we're doing it in a way that's instructional. If we stay focused on the fact that our goal is to change the probability of the student's behavior going forward, we know that, that um, it's, it's not uh, um, okay for us to assume that they're not engaging in the behavior we wanna see because they lack the motivation we need to also consider the possibility that they lack the skills or they lack a clear understanding of what it is that they're supposed to be doing. So um, in, in a multi-tiered system of support, we try to increase um, both um, motivation and skill development so that we can cover both bases with, with that um, going forward. So um, it's important to think about the structure of a multi-tiered system of support and how you're going to um, design and implement the structure that needs to be in place in order to do this work. Um, we really think in terms of not just the practices that we have in place to support students, but the systems that we have in place to support staff and to communicate with one another and to uh, develop these systems. So um, we are thinking of everything from 
um, who is going to take on uh, which new roles. Um, sometimes we're figuring out who would be the best person to do a social skills group with students who need social skills development at tier two. It's not necessarily the school social worker or sometimes it's the school social worker in collaboration with um, one of the teachers who has a free period and who wants to do that. Um, all of those details of the structure and system need to be worked through. Um, we advocate for figuring all of this out through the teaming process and with action plans. So developing action plans that um, identify the desired uh, outcomes and then figuring out the steps that will be necessary to achieve those outcomes. Do you wanna add anything, Rachel? Yeah, I guess I can't emphasize enough that structure matters. And I would argue that it's actually one of the ways that you make the system last for a long time. Um, one of my main heroes in all of this is Dave Tilly from Iowa. And I think it really is about how do we nail things to the wall so we don't have pendulum swings that we've all experienced in public education over the years. So um, thinking of these things in advance makes all the difference. One of my favorite benefits about doing this work is that um, we have found and others have found that Changes, unexpected changes happen, like teachers enjoy coming to work more and students enjoy coming to school more. And we can really develop a virtuous cycle of people feeling supported, feeling like their work is meaningful, um, feeling like they're making progress. For students, feeling like people are noticing the progress that they're making and when they're engaged in, a, in appropriate behavior and all those sorts of things. So um, we are able to, through this system, provide support to all students, make sure that we don't have students falling through the cracks, um, address that age old problem of what, what we've thought of in the past as those gap students. So um, they're struggling, but they're, they don't qualify for a special education. What can we do for them? This answers that question. We now know that we don't have to have students in our buildings that we don't feel like we have something to put in place for them. Um, by doing all of that work, we can reduce the number of students who require a special education. Um, a lot of the work, had, and, and PBIS certainly, has been funded by um, the Office of Special Education Programming because um, the special education community at that level has recognized that we need to, our focus needs to be on prevention. We have students who are being identified for special education who might not have needed a special education if they had gotten support at the first signs of trouble. Um, so that's really the focus of this work, and um, the data have shown over the years that, that we can achieve those goals. The, um, oftentimes, special education dollars in public schools are going toward this work for the same reason, because special education directors are recognizing that if they want to reduce the number of students who are being referred to and identified for special education, we really have to get those students back on track at the first signs of trouble. <clears throat> the other piece that um, I guess you can think of in terms of benefit, but also extension of developing and having a multi-tier system of support in your building or your district is how those supports are able to communicate with and integrate with other types of support. Um, in particular, things like 504 plans and special education, because those are entities that have existed for a very long time for the purpose of supporting students who have certain specific criteria, but as many of us know, they're somewhat limited because they were never designed to meet the needs of all students, and they don't necessarily come with the resources that are, that are going to be effective for all students. So um, I just kind of like to point out that a multi-tier system of support does not in any way replace special education or 504. It was never intended for that, um, and the, um, U.S. Department of Education through OSEP has been very, very clear in multiple administrative letters to point out that utilizing a multi-tier system like this, um, also referred to in terms of their language RTI, cannot be used to delay or prevent special education referral or placement. That would be an incredibly inappropriate use of tiered supports. 
Um, and in fact, the many of the legal cases that have moved forward with regard to um, tiered supports have been around the issue of a district at least appearing to try to delay supports for students. Um, there actually have been very few legal cases about uh, this matter, but the ones that are there um, tend to have something to do with the fact that it was attempted inappropriately. The other piece that I like to point out has to do with the last two bullets. Um, and the way I typically introduce this idea is to remind us all that kids are going to do well in school if they can, but that there are many reasons why they might struggle in school. And sometimes those reasons are more temporary and sometimes they're longer lasting. And one of the benefits of using a strong system of tiered supports is it anticipates and provides a mechanism to at least attempt to help all the students rather than only those who fit into much narrower uh, categories or classifications. And so you may have students who have temporary needs as a result of uh, economic downturn in the community, a family move, family member deployment in the armed services, death of a loved one, Typically, those things are shorter lasting than some other needs um, that could be much more chronic. And again, some of the chronic needs may not necessarily map onto a specific disability. We know that students who change schools frequently throughout each school year, whether within the same district or other districts, are at much more risk for facing challenges in school. That's a chronic issue, but not one that would best be supported by saying the student has a disability. So there are going to be some students who are going to need that extra support for many years. And that's just a reality I think we as educators have a responsibility to accept. But then that's balanced by the fact there are students who are only going to need the, the support briefly. And they will then um, rebound, if you will, and be able to succeed independently with tier one supports alone, whether it be on a behavioral level or on an academic level. And quite honestly, those students outnumber the ones who will need support for longer. So that's the good news. Uh, when I have worked with folks to implement uh, these structures in schools, across the board, teachers are um, pleasantly surprised at how many kids make fast progress and don't need support forever and ever. Um, and I think once you have that experience, you realize, oh, okay, yeah, this can work. Go ahead, yeah. So here are some frequently asked questions, and then we can move on to, um, we'll talk about resources and move on to some of the questions that you've sent to us. Um, Rachel addressed the first question when she showed you the, the figure that we have included in the book and that she's included elsewhere of the relationship between a multi-tiered system of support and special education. No, a multi-tiered system of support is not only for special education, it is for all students. But it is equally important to recognize that it is also for students who have been identified for special education services, um, regardless of, of what type of school they're attending. So this is uh, these are systems that are in place for all of the students that we work with in our schools. I'll talk a little bit about what happens at the universal level for behavior. Um, I mentioned briefly earlier that this the challenge that we have is that this is not a situation where we buy a canned curriculum and then just figure out the best way to implement it. This is really um, the most effective if we develop it among ourselves as a community. With that said, there are really good examples and tons of resources available to, for schools to use. Um, one of the things that's been remarkable about the work in PBIS and largely in part because of OSEP funding is that you can go to pbis.org and find examples of just about anything that you would need to do to develop curriculum at tier one. Um, unfortunately, there are some examples that I would consider more, more toward non-examples as well, but there are good examples. It can be difficult for schools to tell the difference, but there are lots and lots of examples there. So at tier one for behavior, we really need to form a universal team. That team needs to be representative of all of the different groups that are working within the school. It needs, we need to have a representative process in place so that those folks are checking in with the people they're representing and sharing the team's work with those people and then bringing questions and concerns and ideas back to the team. Um, that is the process that allows everyone to have a voice in the process that we're developing. And um, we have um, 
some essential features that we need to develop as part of that process. We need to um, develop our expectations and determine how we're going to teach those to students. And that um, involves um, developing lesson plans. So how are we going to teach what it means to be safe on the bus? And we can develop lesson plans around that. Um, and then we need to determine how we're going to reward students for engaging in the expected behavior, how we're going to shift our focus to focusing on when students do what they're supposed to do instead of simply interacting with them when they've engaged in, in behavior that wasn't what we wanted to see. Um, and then we need to think about how we're going to respond when problem behavior does occur so that we're doing that in, a, in an instructional way, how we're going to have data around student behavior and use those data to guide the development of our process and to know whether or not what we're doing is working. Um, and ultimately how we're going to make our system sustainable over the years. We develop a handbook, um, it's a living document. We're changing it as we go um, from year to year and our, our system is evolving. Um, but that's really what's necessary at tier one. Some schools take a year just to develop the system and then they implement it the following fall. Others prefer to develop a component and then roll it out. Um, either way can work, I've seen both work. Um, one of the challenges is that if you develop a system for teaching expected behavior, but you don't have a system yet for reinforcing that behavior, you're not likely to have a whole lot of success with the teaching process. So I'll talk a bit about academics, but I first want to um, recognize, Rhonda, I know that you have, Rhonda Joy, that you have your hand up. It's far easier for us if you can type in your question into the question box, and then after we go through um, some of these questions, we'll begin um, addressing the ones that have been sent in. So in terms of what happens at Universal or Tier 1 in academics, on some levels, I feel like it's such an easy answer, and it's a bit of a blessing and a curse, because essentially it's whatever has been formally adopted as the accepted um, general education core curriculum in each area. And of course, that's the work schools have been doing ever since schools were invented. Um, and so, you know, it's okay. It's whatever we have in place that we're teaching every day. It's, you know, what the teachers get up to come in to, to teach and what the students get up and come in to learn. Um, that being said, um, one of the interesting parts of this in terms of thinking of academic instruction as part of a tiered system of support is the reality that what a school has in place now may not be optimally effective for the needs of the students who are there. And so therefore, part of the work in terms of planning um, for tiered supports typically involves evalu evaluating how effective is the curriculum you actually have in place at the moment. Um, because it can vary a huge amount in this day and age as a result of initiatives through ESEA, No Child Left Behind, etc. Uh, many places have an identified universal core curriculum in the areas of uh, reading, writing, mathematics, and so forth, but not all. I certainly encounter school districts that have not formally adopted any one program or set of materials um, that they recognize as core. And so there's still quite a bit of variety there. And the first step of work then is gonna to be to figure out, well, what is happening and how well is it working? Because it's through knowing if it's working that all of the next steps are gonna to begin to follow. We know that the tier one universal academic curriculum needs to be effective for at least 80% of the students in order for the rest of the supports to be able to do their job. Um, so careful scrutiny of what do you formally and officially have in place, how well it's working, and how might we change it if it needs to change are really crucial questions relative to Tier 1 academics um, at, at that universal level. I'll go ahead and move on to um, ask, answering about tiered interventions. Um, and the simple answer, it's overly simplistic, is that it depends and there's a huge variety because there's not a rule written in a book anywhere that says only certain people can provide certain tiers of intervention. The really big key is the person who's providing that intervention or instruction be trained to do it because it is through that training and accuracy that students um, will be in a position to make gains. 
Um, and so this kind of goes back to why planning ahead and training is so crucial to making these systems work over the long term. But knowing that it could be a variety of people, uh, typically at tier one, um, most of what's implemented is going to be classroom educators um, because they are kind of our frontline people uh, in all schools at all levels. And typically those are folks who need to hold a specific type of certificate to have that job. Um, and that's perfectly appropriate and good. Um, at tier two and tier three, there tends to be a lot more variability and flexibility. It's possible for classroom teachers to do some of that work, but it's also possible for others. They could be individuals who are hired in a paraprofessional capacity. Again, as long as they're trained um, and that's perfectly appropriate. Um, they could also include specialists, um, and that could be a special educator. It could be a speech language pathologist, a school psychologist, a school counselor. There are many other grown-ups, if you will, in schools who can help make this happen. We need to make sure we have all the right people at the table when we're planning so that we are going to be able to essentially deploy the right staff at the right time. When we think about who's involved in teaching for a multi-tiered system of support for behavior, um, we really want everyone involved um, at the universal level. So we want classroom teachers teaching the expectations for how to behave in the classroom and all the different settings during all the different activities and how to behave in the hall. And um, schools often have fun with this and they make videos and they get everyone involved. And sometimes teachers and principals are being silly as part of this instruction. Um, but trying to model appropriate behavior, sometimes pretending to be students. Uh, we want the people who work in the cafeteria to be involved, and we want the people who drive the buses to be involved, and the people who monitor behavior on the playground to be involved. So it really is um, a community-wide effort at, at the universal level. When we think about tiered interventions for behavior at tier two and tier three, um, what, who will be involved with that really depends on what the students' needs are. Um, so again, sometimes um, I've certainly seen classroom teachers um, do a really good job of implementing a tier two intervention. One of the most common tier two interventions is called check in, check out. And um, oftentimes classroom teachers are uh, facilitating the implementation of that. And um, sometimes I've, it's the music teacher and the art teacher and the school social worker or the school counselor or the school psychologist are all working together to make that happen. Um, sometimes it's the, admin, the school administrative assistant who's greeting students in the morning and, and checking in with them. And sometimes it's the classroom teachers. It really depends on what will work in any given school. Um, but that's an intervention that has been shown to be effective for between 60 and 70% of students, depending on the study that you look at, um, who are struggling with behavior um, that really have a tier two level of need. So that can account for a, a lot of the students who need support at that level. When we think in terms of the need to develop um, anger management skills or other social skills um, or other coping strategies, um, we typically are thinking about getting our special educators and our building clinicians involved in that work. Um, because oftentimes, um, even if you're working with a small group of students who are struggling to manage frustration and, and anger, um, things will come up that it's really helpful to have some a clinical background to address in, in those settings. Um, but again, oftentimes a clinician is doing that in conjunction with the classroom teacher or a special education teacher, and people are really finding ways to collaborate to do this work. Um, when you get to a tier three level, it really is important to have someone with behavioral expertise um, involved in, in that process. We uh, often want to do a functional behavioral assessment and develop behavior, uh, behavioral interventions that are function-based so that we're addressing the specific needs of that student who's, who's continuing to struggle. <clears throat> I will dive in and talk about um, where you can find progress measures. And the good news is that there is a website that is my go-to when I want to see what might be the most appropriate progress measure um, in any of these domains, academic or behavioral. And that is the National Center for Intensive Intervention. And many of you, I imagine, have probably heard of them. Um, they are the successor 
to two previous um, virtual technical assistance centers that have been funded through OSEP um, that have been really powerful tools and allies in all this work. Um, and where what is present there at the NCII site um, is an annually updated list of um, reviewed progress measures um, that then you can look at, examine their technical features and see um, which one might be the most appropriate for the needs of the students that you're looking to serve. So uh, I strongly encourage you to get to know the National Center for Intensive Intervention website and you can get on their mailing list to get updates from them as well. I'll go ahead. Do you want to add anything on progress? No, it's just, again, the good news yeah. is that there are progress measures yeah. available for a variety of things. Mm -hmm. um, it can be more challenging if you're working on issues that are behavioral or social. Um, and sometimes um, it's important to recognize the outcomes that you're focused on and um, developing measures that are relevant to those outcomes for the, for the work that you're doing with students in those areas. So in terms of parent permission, this is one that I get very frequently, and so I've become pretty accustomed to answering. I'm sure Becca has too. Mm -hmm. The short version is no. Um, if whatever you're doing as a part of a uh, tiered system of supports is clearly articulated in the materials uh, that you regularly um, share and publicize for the parents and families in your community, in the, in the area that your school supports, um, then you don't need additional permission to use them because you've said, this is our core instructional, these are our core instructional programs. If students need additional help, we will choose from some of these. If they need still more help, we'll choose from some of these. Um, that being said, it's not legally necessary to get that extra permission. However, best practices, I certainly would uh, want my daughter's teacher to be letting me know she's struggling, and I'd want to know that at the earliest possible sign. So best practice is going to be to communicate with families as often as you can to support students. I'm well aware that some families engage more readily than others um, and that it can be really frustrating because a student who uh, needs really, really intensive support may not have a family that's responding to the school. But that doesn't negate the fact that we can initiate the outreach and be as available as possible so that there's good communication throughout. Yep, I would agree with that. I think um, when we are doing universal screening three times a year, and we're looking at both academics and behavior, and um, sometimes we have existing data for behavior that can guide us in that work. If we have uh, the school-wide information system and we're collecting office discipline referrals and um, we have other measures for measuring appropriate behavior, we can also do universal screening to look at um, internalizing and externalizing behaviors, and there are a number of different um, um, options for doing that and doing it well. Um, those are things that we're doing for all of the students in our building. I would be more concerned if we were identifying a certain group of students and, and doing that just for them. But when we're doing something um, as a matter of course, as the way we do business in our school and we're applying it to all of the students in our building, um, those, are, those are typically things that we're not getting parental permission for. So obviously there's a lot more information about this topic. And what we're gonna do now is to put up, um, actually I'm gonna jump over the summary slide, but um, put up um, some additional resources. And um, these include resources that might not be as familiar to you because um, we certainly mentioned some websites and other uh, things and those are good, but we wanted to share things that might not be necessarily as familiar. And we'll leave that up while then we look at some of the questions you've submitted. So Becca, if you want to start um, there, I will make sure we monitor our question list here. One of you sent in a very good question, probably one of the most common questions that we get that wasn't on the list that we just shared with you, and that is, how do we get buy-in? So when we think about buy-in, oftentimes we're talking about getting buy-in among um, the school community that we're working in, and that is something that's um, very important to do, and I've talked with you about the process for doing that. Um, people also wonder about getting buy-in at the district level or at the administrative level. So sometimes there are teachers who've learned about multi-tiered systems of support and who would like to be working within that framework, um, but the district is either unaware of, of that approach or um, has not 
decided that that's an investment that it wants to make. Um, that can be a more difficult goal to accomplish. Um, sometimes, uh, I've certainly seen many cases where people at the district level got excited about multi-tiered systems of support by attending something like the webinar that we're doing today or a workshop or a conference. Um, I think at all of our national and international conferences in this field, um, both in, in the academic realm and the behavioral realm, um, there are oftentimes a lot of administrators there who have come to learn more about this way of doing things. They've Perhaps they've uh, talked to a colleague in another district who has decided to move in this direction or who has these systems in place and is finding success as a result. And they get, or they read an article or, or something in a trade publication that gets them excited about this work and they come to find out more. Um, those things are often um, really important. It is also perfectly acceptable for a, a group of educators to arrange to meet with the folks in the district office, um, whomever they might be in your case, and talk about why they're interested in this approach and talk about um, what they've read about this or colleagues that they've had that have been involved or um, things that they've learned from reading any of the books that we have um, displayed on your screen right now. So sharing information I think is really important. Um, one of the things that we know about the change process at the individual level is that people generally don't move in a direction because they're pushed in that direction. They generally move in a direction because um, they're invited and they see the need and they're um, open to, to learning a new way of doing things. So we have another question um, about embedding problem solving and data driven decision making into the culture of a school. That is one of my favorite questions ever because um, that is another area where there's been a lot of um, investment in the national level in developing a process. So it's been um, widely recognized for quite some time um, that it is difficult for school teams to collaborate and, and engage in the change process effectively, to use data effectively, um, and to implement effective practices. So um, there is a system available called the Team Initiated Problem Solving Process. Um, it's not something that is necessarily immediately intuitive to everyone, um, but it is a process that uh, incorporates um, a standard problem solving process with data and database decision making at every step of the problem solving process. So um, we typically refer to it as TIPS, T-I-P-S. And if you um, Google team initiated problem solving, you will very likely see examples of the TIPS process and the format and resources that you could use to do that. Um, that is something that there are trainings available uh, for people to um, learn those skills and become facilitators and take them back to schools and those sorts of things. But it is typically a foreign process for most educators, um, but it is a very effective process and it is a process that's available to you um, when you're working in schools to do this work. Okay. Um, there have been a couple questions about um, more information about curriculum-based measurement for math. So I decided to dive in and look at that one. Um, there are four major published curriculum-based measurement sets that are available uh, nationally, certainly in the United States, probably also in Canada. Um, and these include names that might be familiar to, me, to you, like AmesWeb, believe it or not, Dipples. Easy CBM and a product called Fast, put out by FastBridge. Um, and all of those do have some form of math CBM. They vary quite a bit. And so it is well worth looking into the technical features of all of those. And as far as I know, all but the dibbles for math have been reviewed on the National Center for Intensive Intervention website. Now, many people are surprised to learn there's dibbles for math, um, but in fact, it, it does exist. It is currently in a limited release because they are collecting um, what I imagine will be the final phase of um, data to validate the specific measures. But if you're interested in, for example, if you are already a district that's using Dibbles, it's probably worth your investigating the Dibbles for math measures because it would be a, a pretty obvious companion. 
Um, but we haven't had as much research over the years with regard to mathematics proficiency. Um, it's something we know we have a huge need in, and I predict you'll continue to see more resources available to help with uh, progress, well, both screening and progress monitoring students in mathematics. And that, you know, includes tools that uh, start at basic pre-numeracy skills and go all the way to at least um, beginning algebra skills. I guess we're we're bumping up against the clock here, but I just noticed a question from um, Danielle, uh, who is a social worker who's working in a school that does not have a multi-tiered system of support in place. And I can only see part of the question, but I think it goes on to say, is this something that social workers can get involved with? And um, I would just say to you, there are there are states where the PBIS initiative has been led by social workers. So this is absolutely appropriate for you. Um, I think that this is something that anyone who's working in a school community can get involved with and really lead his or her colleagues toward. Well, we have hit the five o'clock mark, so we're going to need to sign off for today. We know there are many other questions we couldn't get to. We will um, do our best to follow up with folks as much as we can with those. Um, several folks have asked about the recording. It is going to be posted on the Smart for Schools website uh, within the next 24 hours. Um, and so it will be continuously available as a resource for yourselves or other colleagues who might be interested. And also, please know that we have additional webinars um, that we will be advertising um, this uh, academic year. And so if you return to the Smart for Schools website over the year, you'll see that we have um, other offerings all in relation to effective instruction for students. Thank you very much and have a good evening.